So hello and welcome everybody to the James A. Garfield National Historic Site Leaders and Legacies program. Today we're going to talk about Jewish Americans and their Civil War experiences. And you know, this is kind of a niche topic. Uh, it's one that's come around over the last, oh, I'd say decade or so. You see more scholarship being pushed out now than frankly ever before. And yet it's something that, I mean, when you're doing the history of a people, as a historian, you have to be careful because you can go into a lot of bizarre rabbit holes and end up in places you don't want to talk about. But also, you want to do something that does honor and service to the people who fought or participated broadly on either side of the war. Some people are a little preferential to one side or the other, Team Union. But that said, I wanted to kind of do some broad brush strokes, talk about some of the heroes of the war, and then in addition, talk also a little bit about what we have going on locally here in Cleveland, Ohio as well. So uh, this is a pretty standard talk. I'm going to try and talk for about 45 minutes, leave about 15 minutes for questions. My favorite game in the world, Hand to God, is called Stump the Ranger. <laughs> and if you can do that, you win nothing. But that said, I will look a little embarrassed. Uh, I turn really red when I am embarrassed, so that will be fun. So. You know, it's interesting. The Civil War, and for my regulars here, you know, is a monumental conflict that spans a continent. As they said in the 1990 Civil War documentary by Ken Burns, the Civil War is fought in 10,000 places. And you can see kind of a neat little, what I'll call a heat map of the various locales around the country where it was fought. You see things all the way up close to us here in, well, I'll call it Southeast Ohio broadly, but that's probably not a fair term all the way down to Florida and as far west as New Mexico and up to the Dakotas. Hmm. Might be interesting as we talk about civil war in the west later on this June. That's my own little plug. But think about it. When you have a continent-wide war that's going to have really involved millions of people and the fates of nations, let alone the fates of the people who live in the nations, you're going to see a lot of different types of people participate in the war. You're going to see you know, people who I think most Americans think of when they think of the Civil War, what we'll call white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, or as they called them in the 1990s, WASPs. But you're going to see African Americans participate in the war. You'll see Native Americans participate in the war, especially down in Arkansas and Missouri. And one group that has historically been overlooked to a great degree is Jewish American participation. Now, if anybody here is of Jewish faith or ancestry, you might say to yourself, well, were people in America during this time period? My family came over in, and oftentimes when I talk about this portion, people say like 1900, 1910s, 1920s, sometimes in the 1930s. Do we have a lot going on before that? And the answer is, surprisingly enough, yes, yes we did. There have been people of the Jewish faith in North America for a very long time. Benjamin Franklin himself actually remarked that he was a big fan of Philadelphia's Jewish community. He thought they led very honest, noble lives. And compared to many of the people he saw of the Christian faith in Philadelphia, were a little bit more forthcoming with their views and tried to live more to their religion than he saw of his own contemporaries. But yet, you know, that's obviously a bit of a ways away from the Civil War, almost 90 years away if we're looking at the writings. And we see that we have a very small collection of Jewish communities. But then something happens. We think of the Civil War as kind of an American-only experience, although there will be naval encounters off the coast of France, but maybe we'll talk about that as well later this year. What we see in this time period is that we're seeing what we'll call early globalization. Now, let's take a step back. What does that mean? The world's more inter interconnected during this time period than I think a lot of people would give it credit for. You know, if you think about, well, let's talk about the root cause of the Civil War, slavery. I mean, the indications of what we have here, African slavery, is brought over from people who are shipped from Africa and then eventually are just kind of, you know, locally incorporated here. But we're already starting to see these international patterns of trade, commerce, and travel between nations and people. 
So you get to Germany, you get to Poland, you get to France, the year is eh, roughly 1848, 1849. And when I was going to high school, and perhaps for you as well, we didn't talk about this subject, but it was called the Revolutions of 1848. Now, this is not a topic that, at least, like I said, I covered in school. Perhaps you did. You know, topics throughout history change and what we teach. But one of the things that we'll note is that during this revolution of 1848, you know, things, it's the largest revolutionary period in Europe during that time. You'll see it in France, you'll see it in Germany, or what will eventually become Germany, the various German states. You'll see it in Prussia, Austria, Poland, a little bit in Russia. And in doing so, most of these revolutions don't succeed. But one group of people, far more than the rest of them, unfortunately gets pegged as being the fermenters of revolution across Europe. Would anybody like to take a guess of who that group might be? Now, unfortunately, Jewish people get persecuted in Europe, so they decide we're going to hightail it out of Europe and try and find somewhere else where we can live peacefully and perhaps a little bit more happily. They come to the New World, and specifically, they come to the United States. Now, this picture, admittedly, is a little bit more advanced than what we see here. Uh, that's roughly about, what, 1910, but it gets the same sentiment. People have been coming to the New World for new opportunities and new life for, geez, hundreds, almost half a thousand years, so 500 years or so now at this point. You know, it's the land of opportunity and always has been, and people from all around the world have been doing it. So we have that very early period of Jewish immigration, small numbers, like we said, Ben Franklin knew a lot of Jewish people during this time. And then we'll have this period right after the 1840s. This is known as the German immigration period. Um, the one that most people who are of the Jewish faith today can oftentimes point to as their direct ancestors are from a later period known as the Eastern European immigration period. But we're gonna focus mostly on the German immigration period today. Um, it would later be dwarfed by that Eastern European period though. So here we have just kind of a little descriptor of a little bit of a teaser of what we'll talk about later on. Right in the middle of what's now Germany, there's a small, and I mean small, less than a thousand person town at this time called Unsleben, Germany. And a lot of those people are going to pick up and come right here to Northeast Ohio. Now, as we think about that, we'll kind of find a lot of those traditions are deeply rooted in this German immigration period and that, frankly, even temples around here can be traced back to this period from about 19, 1830 or so. But like I said, we see a lot of them here in uh, North America. Baltimore has one of the earliest large Jewish communities starting in 1830. We will then have Louis, or Louisville in 1836, showing my Yankee by calling it Louisville. Um, we will have Albany in 1838. We'll have Columbus in 1840. We'll have Chicago in 1845, and last but definitely not least, Cleveland in 1839. Now you're noticing, again, you have kind of this period right before the revolutions. We're starting to see a lot of fermentation of people are coming over here to start new communities. This is a big deal. Let's be real. I mean, the United States is a melting pot, and people have been coming over here of different faiths, beliefs, ethnicities from time immemorial. And this is a classic case of that. But what's mind blowing is just how much immigration we saw from people of the Jewish faith from this time period. At the beginning of this time period before the German immigration period, the United States had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven temples. By 1860, right as we're about to head head first, literally, into the Civil War, we have a grand total of, oh, I believe it was 160. I actually put all those up there to make sure that we had an accurate number. I mean, think about that. That's a huge jump in people of Jewish faith from around here. And you'll see that people from Northeast Ohio would have gone from, let's say, James A. Garfield, barely knowing anybody of a Jewish faith, to it was a pretty common thing to find. So, as you can imagine, with such rapid expansion of the Jewish communities, we see that they're going to participate in the Civil War as well. And, you know, a lot of people think, okay, this is going to be a very one-sided experience. 
And if you know, the Union will have 150,000 Jewish people participate in the course of the war. But we can't necessarily dismiss the South as saying they have no Jewish people throughout the entire course of the war. 25,000 people of the Jewish faith will participate and fight for the South throughout the war. I mean, that's bigger than most college football stadiums. We'll leave out like the Big Ten in Ohio State, but most college football stadiums can be filled up with the number of people <coughs> who are Jewish who fought for the war on the South. And I mean, that's just, it's a monumental number if you think about it. I mean, that's a really big group of people. Um, there was another talk I wanted to give about Muslims in the Civil War. Yes, there were a few Muslims who participated, but to my understanding, I could probably count them on one or two hands, maybe my toes if I got really creative. But we could never in our lifetime cover every Jewish experience throughout the war because there's just so many who will participate. Now, it's interesting to note that about eight to 10,000 of these people will actually actively fight throughout the war and 50 of them will actually become officers. Which again, you know, we're talking about a time period which we don't tend to think of as, I guess, religiously tolerant. And yet here we have a time period where 50 people of the Jewish faith are going to lead troops who have a different faith than them into battle. That's a pretty monumental step. And when we talk about well, the Jeffersonian principles of all men are created equal, and that we're striving for a better union, this is one of what Lincoln would call his better angels, I would say. And I think you'd probably agree with me on that one. But I wanted to talk today instead about, you know, you can hear about Civil War soldiers every day, you know, the Grants, the Shermans, the James A. Garfields. What I wanted to talk to you about, though, today was a little bit different. It's a little bit more about leadership in the war. And we're going to see that here today. Uh, let's start with some Yankee leadership with this gentleman right here. This is Edward Solomon. He's the governor of Wisconsin during the majority of the Civil War. And um, great mustache, interesting guy. And you know, Wisconsin is not a small participant in the course of the war. This is not, oh, Nevada or California who will send a nominal number of troops. I mean, Wisconsin will have some of the most famous brigades of the war. I mean, there's the famous Iron Brigade, which takes some of the heaviest casualties throughout the war, three regiments of which Mr. Solomon helped recruit. And he's an interesting character, let me tell you. He's the ninth governor of Wisconsin. He is, depending on which historian you talk to, the first or second Jewish governor in American history. I, the reason I say the first or second is because there was in about the year 1800 a Jewish governor in Georgia. Um, however, he eventually renounces his faith and he was kind of quibbling when he became governor. So a lot of people go to bat to try and argue whether or not he was the first. But needless to say, the first of many. And it's a fascinating guy. He started off his life here in, and forgive me, my German is horrendous. Schaffdorf, and he was involved in those 1848 revolutions. He was a revolutionary. He did not like monarchicalism. He did not really believe in the divine right of kings, which, remember, this is post-Napoleon. We're really in that you know, high watermark of imperialism and kingship in Europe. And he wanted to see more of a democratic process. That didn't work out for him. So he comes to Manitowoc, Wisconsin, and he will start off living like pretty much any other immigrant in the United States during this period. He is going to start originally as a salesman, and he's going to ultimately join the Wisconsin Bar in 1855. Now, I assume I have probably a couple of people here who might be interested in the course of Civil War history. If you see a lot of common trends, one of the fastest ways up the political ladder during this time period is to become an attorney. Think about it. Abraham Lincoln's an attorney. Jefferson Davis was an attorney. Um, apparently, Edward Solomon was an attorney as well. He joins the Wisconsin Bar in 1855. He uh, partners with a local man from Wisconsin as well. And he's active in his community. Remember, judges are elected, so it helps to actually be participating in who you know and how to get them elected. So he will join the Republican Party in 1860. A pretty good year to join the Republican Party if there's ever been one. And in doing so, by two years later, he's lieutenant governor of Wisconsin. Now, like I said, that's pretty much going from immigrant to 
you know, one of the most powerful men in your state in pretty much warp speed. But I want to introduce to you a man he knew really well, uh, Lewis P. Harvey. He was a fellow early joiner of the Republicans. We'll call him like an early investor into the party. And he was not lieutenant governor of Wisconsin. That is an error on my part, forgive me. He was the governor of Wisconsin in 1862. And he had big ideas. He was going to be a wartime governor. You know, not a bad position to be in if you have bigger political ambitions. But tragedy strikes Governor Harvey. He heads south to go examine some of the troops. And he goes to Shiloh. And unfortunately, as he's crossing over the Tennessee River, his boat capsizes. He drowns. They don't find his body for 14 days. Well, you can kind of figure out what happens there. He's lying in state in the Wisconsin Rotunda. And Edward Solomon, unwittingly, has now become the governor of one of the most powerful Union states in the country. So that's a pretty big responsibility to move into. You know, we oftentimes think about what Andrew Johnson was doing after Lincoln's assassination. But here we have Mr. Solomon, a handsome guy, if I may say so, very much the modern look today. Now, is one of the most powerful men in a state that's largely contributing to the war effort. So what do we see under his leadership? We see a man who's devoted to his state. He will ultimately help produce a huge amount of wheat for the war. Wisconsin's number one production good back in this time is not cheese, folks. I know, it's not shocking to think today. Uh, Wisconsin's number one production for the war effort was wheat. And they grew it in, I guess we'll say, by the bushel full. Because of that, Wisconsin economy grows. And it helps the people who are there, because one in nine men from Wisconsin will fight in the war. That means when you take one of nine employ potential employees out of the market, everybody else who's still in the state, well, their pay goes up. Things are looking pretty good for Wisconsin. In addition, he'll increase the railroad industry out there, which, I mean, infrastructure is one of those bizarre little highlights of the Civil War that when people talk about how great Lincoln was, they say he ended slavery, he saved the Union, and oh yeah, he added infrastructure. Solomon was very concerned about infrastructure in his state. He wanted to make sure that as we expanded westward that the infrastructure was ready to go. And he wanted to make sure that internal railroads were also going to be produced and working well. So credit where credit's due, a really great wartime governor. There are plenty who will not stand up to the call of duty near as efficiently as Mr. Solomon does. Now what's interesting, so he serves one term, 1864. He decides he's going to retire. He moves to New York. He starts a law practice there working for Jewish immigrants and Germans, kind of specializing in people that, uh, I guess, ancestry, we'll call it. And fascinatingly enough, by the end of his life, about nine years before he dies, he moves back to Germany. I think that seems a little bizarre today. I mean, Americans think, oh, you know, you become governor of the state, and but you're kind of locked in. You can't move away. You can't have a vacation home. But Mr. Solomon moved back because he didn't, I guess, necessarily feel the need of that he did his duty to Wisconsin. And once his duty was done, he was free from his burden. Again, just fascinating points. What I want to kind of do with you today is give you some interesting things to research on your own if you're into this sort of thing. That said, uh, the other thing that's kind of neat to know about Governor Solomon is that he came from what we'll call kind of a Civil War dynasty family. You see, it wasn't just Mr. Solomon who had a pretty successful career in his family. But we'll see just by example here. Um, his brother, his older brother actually, Frederick Solomon, was a major general through the course of the war, which if we think about kind of our rankings in the Union Army, Major generals are the second highest rank in the army. You know, Sherman was a major general. Garfield was a major general. Grant was a major general until they promoted him to lieutenant general. Um, he was the highest ranking Jewish officer during the course of the war. Uh, he fought bravely, mostly out west. Governor Solomon's younger brother, Charles Solomon, served as a colonel under his brother Frederick, and then ultimately would be promoted to brigadier general just at the tail end of the war. Now, I have to say that I think their mother must have been rather proud to find out that their sons became governor, major general, and brigadier general. But just to add that cherry on top, we'll also introduce ourselves to the other Governor Edward Solomon. And Governor Edward Solomon was also a colonel during the course of the war, but he led a really interesting life after the war. 
What he had done was that he went west and grew up with the country, as they used to say. He was the governor of Washington Territory. So, you know, before Washington becomes a state, the other governor, Edward Solomon, was out there working. And once it becomes a state, what does he do? Does he stay in Washington? No, he follows his cousin's tradition and moves to California, where he becomes a state legislator. Funny to think. Uh, but talk about a powerful political dynasty. And yet, these are all Jewish Americans who were devoted to their country and wanted to see the best for it, and ultimately save the Union. Now turning south, which a lot of people like to do when talking about the war, I'm going to introduce to you a different gentleman. Now he's frankly far more famous than the Solomons, but you may have even heard his name. This is Judah P. Benjamin, perhaps the most powerful man of the Jewish faith in North America at this time. And you know, it's interesting. This fella should really be one of those characters in the history books that we all know about. The thing is, is that ultimately, because of the Civil War, as we'll find out here, he's not somebody who's well remembered by comparison. But Mr. Benjamin served a, wore a lot of hats in his life. He was an attorney general for the Confederacy. He was Secretary of War, Secretary of State. He went to Yale Law School. He was an attorney. He was a prominent uh, member of the Queen's Bench, and we'll talk all about that. But let's just start off here with the fact that he's a fascinating guy with an ill-fated marriage and a lot of intrigue and globetrotting, to say the least. He did it all. So I guess we'll start off here. What's amazing about him to me, if you ask me, is that he is the first Jewish man to serve in the United States Senate who did not renounce his faith. Uh, he was considered sharp as a tack. I mean, really one of the great minds of the Senate. And frankly, had he not decided to join the Confederacy, he might be considered one of the greatest senators of all time. Uh, we've had a lot of pointed discussions at Garfield site since then about Mr. Benjamin and that kind of result. So in the year 1853, he becomes a United States senator. He's the first openly Jewish senator. And I mean, this is a really big moment in American history. You know, we've never had a Jewish president yet. But one of the things that's really fascinating to note is that during this time period, people don't look at the presidency the way we do today. Back in that era, you know, there are three co-equal branches to our government. There's the executive branch, run by the presidency. There's the legislative branch, which is the Senate and the House. And we have the judicial branch of the Supreme Court. During this time period, we see that the United States Congress has a disproportionate larger amount of power than it does to, I don't know, than it oftentimes is considered to have today. And the United States Senate of those two houses is oftentimes considered the more powerful house. And just think about it. Mathematically, there are hundreds of representatives in the House of Representatives. There are, in this time period, oh, roughly about 60 or so senators. If you're one of a couple hundred voters, well, your vote's watered down compared to when you're one of 60. And Mr. Benjamin was considered truly one of the great minds of the South during this time period. And so he had a huge impact on the nation at this time period. We see him investing in the railroads. We see him well, really arguing on behalf of slavery. He claims that Uncle Tom's Cabin is a terrible case a study in terms of talking about slavery. He was obviously a big proponent of slavery. and. Fascinatingly enough, he's also one of the biggest reasons that we see Abraham Lincoln win the election of 1860. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second here. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of things, Benjamin was born in what today would be known as the United States Virgin Islands. His parents had moved from England to there after the British Empire had taken that over during the Napoleonic Wars. They had hoped to strike it rich. Well, unfortunately, that didn't work out for them. So they moved to the land of opportunity, the United States where they moved to another very large and prominent Jewish community, Charlestown, South Carolina. Now, I don't know about you, I did not expect Charlestown, South Carolina to be a big Jewish community in the United States during this time period. But as it turns out, it was a fairly large and sufficient one. And Jewish people were not treated, I guess, with great discrimination compared to what some may imagine or what one would expect. Because ultimately, on the ladder of call it like ethnic hierarchy, 
there was a group who was scapegoated far more than Jewish people, it was African Americans. So Mr. Benjamin had a wide range of opportunities, although he grew up poor in Charleston. Uh, his mother actually worked by selling fruit in a fruit stand in the city streets. But then he got really what was one of the great lucky breaks of his lifetime. He goes to Yale. And uh, even today, you know, if you're going to an Ivy League school like that, things are going to look pretty good for you. And he will stay there for two years, starting at the age of 14. So from 14 to 16 years old, he'll be at Yale Law School. Uh, he leaves mysteriously. Some say it was because of a love affair. Some say it was because of gambling debts. Some say that he just angered his professor so greatly that, well, he had to leave. But he leaves nonetheless. He moves to Louisiana. And he starts out with literally nothing in his pockets. Literally, the clothes on his back is where he starts. Um, he begins as a teacher teaching English to, remember, this is a time period where the French have still been colonizing Louisiana up until 30 years prior, what we'll call French Creoles. He meets a young one, um, Natalie Bausch, again, forgive me on my pronunciation, Bausch de Saint-Martin, and he falls in love with her. She's probably 16 years old at this point. And she is part of a prominent enslaving family in the community. She marries off to Mr. Benjamin, and they have, I mean, talk about one of the worst marriages in American history. Um, there were discussions of whether or not his kid was actually his, whether or not they actually loved each other. She will move to France later on, taking their daughter with him, with her. And uh, it'll be like 20 years before he sees his kids again. Um, Benjamin did this for a variety of reasons. We won't ask about the nature of his love, but the long and the short is that the way that you moved up in life was to marry successfully in the political world, especially as an immigrant son. And for him to be able to move into and marry a prominent planter family, it opened so many doors for him. Pretty quickly thereafter, he's running in the state legislature. And what is it? By the year, of, I think he's 43 years old. He's a United States senator. And in this time period, people are saying, are we sure that we want somebody who just moved here to be a United States senator representing Louisiana? Are we sure that we want somebody who doesn't seem like us, doesn't pray at the same church. These are questions that people have. But the one thing that Mr. Benjamin has over all his, we'll call them competitors in Louisiana politics, is that he's incredibly successful. He's very smart. And he's a brilliant orator. He's a great lawyer. And they know that if they send him to the Senate, well, the goals and ambitions of those large planner classes are going to be able to have their wishes put upon the United States Senate. And shockingly, this works great for them. Like I said, he railed on Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's one of his most famous speeches he gives. And he <laughs> meets a fellow senator from Mississippi by the name of Benj or Jefferson Davis. And uh, I think we've all heard of Jefferson Davis once or twice before in American history, right? Um, they met each other at a dinner party. And this is a great story, because Jefferson Davis looked at uh, Mr. Benjamin, all first names, so it gets kind of hard really quickly. And he thought he was what they called a bon vivant, essentially kind of flippant, uh, not really one who's entrenched in policy or caring about the country. He just wants the finer things. Davis was not particularly good at judging character in the first try, I guess we'll have to say. And so during the course of the war, we see that they will actually work together. Um, but before the war starts, what we see is that Benjamin Davis was actively running in Democrat politics. He was not running for president, but he did not want to see Stephen Douglas elected to the Democrat ticket. Uh, as many of us know from the election of 1860, the Democrats actually offer a split ticket. You have the Northern Democrats with Stephen Douglas, and then you have your Southern Democrats with John C. Beckinridge. And Benjamin hated Stephen Douglas, because he had kind of waffled on slavery. He used to be a strong proponent and ally for them. And as he grew a little bit more uncomfortable, especially with expansion westward, well, as Benjamin said, he'd rather vote for Abraham Lincoln, because at least he sticks to his principles by comparison. Because of Benjamin's meddling in the Democratic nomination, Lincoln effectively does win the election of 1860. And we're off to the races for that small event called the Civil War, the reason we're all here today. So the war breaks out, and immediately Benjamin realizes that he's in probably grave danger. Louisiana secedes fairly quickly, 
and he leaves from Washington to head to New Orleans, never to return. During the course of the war, the same day he leaves from Washington, Jefferson Davis is elected the provisional president of the Confederate States of America, and he builds a war cabinet. Now, you can kind of see the men on his war cabinet, and I think they do a decent depiction here. You can actually tell Mr. Davis is the one on the far left there. And Mr. Davis, again, the great legal mind of the war, is appointed as attorney general. And Southerners say this is a terrible choice. One of the most unique things about the Confederate States is they didn't have a Supreme Court, at least at the time. And so why do you need an attorney general if you don't have a place for them to litigate? Uh, Mr. Benjamin will do his duty, and he'll do it well. One of the most remarkable pieces that he'll talk about whether or not lemons and oranges should enter the Confederacy duty-free, as in they don't have to pay import tax. But walnuts should have to pay import tax on that. And this is the things that he'll be working on. And again, people said this was a waste. He should be off in France or Britain trying to coax the Europeans into the war. Now, eventually Davis comes around to this decision. And even though he considered Davis or uh, Benjamin a great nominee for the Attorney General because of his very high reputation as a lawyer and knowing him from the Senate, he promotes him off to the Secretary, or the Secretary of War. And so here we go. Mr. Benjamin, already the most high-ranking Jewish official in North America up to this point, is going to be promoted to run a war that stretches from Virginia to Texas. Again, a war of 10,000 places. His job is to get supply lines and logistics taken care of, be able to actually operate and make sure that the generals have what they need. And Again, I have to assume that some of you are probably interested in the Civil War, right? Mr. Benjamin is day after day fighting with the generals in the field. Uh, Lee was a little bit more pacifistic towards Benjamin. Lee also got most of the things he wanted because he was defending Richmond. Uh, but yet you see other generals from the war who are not going to be near as pleased with Mr. Benjamin's production. Um, and they will oftentimes say that it's because of him that the war is failing, and eventually public opinion will turn away from Benjamin. Uh, the war is not going well, and as you know, each progressive year comes by, by 1863, 1864, people are saying, we really need to get him out of here. And so he gets what we'll call promoted upstairs to the Secretary of State's office. Now, unfortunately, by this point, for, I say unfortunately from the perspective of Benjamin, not unfortunately from the perspective of the Union. The time has now passed for Benjamin to be an actual effective Secretary of State. The role that that job does is essentially the chief diplomat of the United States, and Davis assigned him the goal of getting France and England into the war. Now, of course, the first thing the Confederacy tried to do was to essentially say, well, no more cotton for them. Well, unfortunately, those great empires managed to just produce cotton in Egypt instead. And the Trent Affair, a very famous affair in American history where a couple of, uh, I believe it was British ambassadors, were taken by a United States naval vessel, had already nearly brought the British and the United States into the brink of war in the midst of the Civil War. But they had smoothed it over, and those ambassadors had headed on their way. And consequently, there was not a lot for Benjamin to do. Um, and the pro-slavery, pro-Confederacy faction in Parliament had unfortunately lost after the Emancipation Proclamation because that made the war about slavery from that point forward. And as a very anti-slave society, they weren't able to get around it. So Benjamin, unfortunately, from his perspective, isn't able to actually finish much in regards there. And, well, by the year 1865, he's heading on a train southwards to try and escape the country with Jefferson Davis and the War Treasury. Uh, Davis famously has this whole story about he's caught, and they say he was caught in women's clothing. But Benjamin escapes. Uh, he will take a sloop out from, I believe it's Florida, heading towards Britain. And he starts again from nothing. A really unfortunate thing in his case here, because to start from nothing is not where anybody wants to start, especially in the middle of their lifetime. But don't feel that bad for him. Things turn out well for him. Uh, he goes off to Britain, and he decides that he's going to do the thing he does best. He's going to go back to being an attorney. 
Uh, he works in what's called Lincoln's Temple. Think of it like as the bar for uh, different British chanceries. And he will ultimately end up as Queen's Counsel, essentially an attorney for the Queen during this time period. And he is a very successful attorney over there. He will write a tome of a treatise talking about American and French trade and the legal implications that is hailed as one of the great pieces of legal literature from this time period. And fascinating enough, I mean, you know, you have Americans over here saying, wasn't Judah P. Benjamin the guy in the war? Yes, yes, he was. And he will ultimately lead the rest of his life as a very successful attorney. Yeah, just, I wanted to talk about both Mr. Benjamin and Mr. Solomon to talk about kind of the highlights of leadership during the war. And I think both of them are very interesting characters. But quickly, I want to talk to you just a little bit about Jewish Cleveland, especially before the war. Uh, this is a picture of Cleveland, Ohio from about the year mm, 1850 or so. And, you know, Cleveland, Ohio was not that big of a town prior to the Industrial Revolution. In fact, if you think about what Cleveland was like, I think you'd say it seems kind of different from today. Remember, it's settled by New Englanders. It is a small Protestant town. Uh, there is one Catholic church. There are six Protestant churches, Episcopalian, a couple of Methodist churches, a Presbyterian church, so on and so forth. And we see a group from that Unsleben, Germany, move over here. And they will start off really, and this is one of the interesting things, is that they start off essentially peddling the goods that they have to sell. And many of them will become clothers, merchants. One becomes a banker. A few of them actually will fight in the war. And we see people who go from immigrants, dirt poor, coming here to try and start a new life, to people who are successful, leaders in their own community. And it's just a we have at least 850 immigrants who will move to Cleveland, Ohio from Unsleben, Germany, and we see just a huge population boom for them here. Now, I don't know if this group here actually has anybody of the Jewish faith in Northeast Ohio, but we actually have two members, or two Jewish synagogues, which are still part of the kind of original Unsleben group. Um, again, bear with me here. I'm a Gentile trying to do uh, pronunciation here. It's Anshe Cheshid, today known as Fairmont Temple. That's the one on the left. And then we also have Tifereth Israel, which is the temple here on the right. Um, these are some of the oldest Jewish communities actually in uh, the United States west of the Appalachians. The oldest one is actually in Cincinnati, which is quite neat. And we see a community here that's thriving, prospering. The first Jewish ceremonies will have, you know, Jewish weddings, Jewish funerals. We'll have an actual butcher because it took multiple people to actually properly butcher an animal according to the faith at this time. And it's a community that grows and prospers within a smaller community of Cleveland as is already. Um, it's just a fascinating story where we see a ton of people who were involved in the war. Now, like I said, they start off as merchants tailors, things of that nature, dry goods, very few tradesmen, a couple of carpenters. But once the war breaks out, we actually see that these people are starting to participate in the war effort. Um, they did not insulate themselves from the war. This was a war for all Americans. Again, 10,000 places and spanning a continent does that to people. And 19 people from this early group will actually join the war effort themselves. Um, multiple of the businessmen will say that they'll produce uniforms for the war effort. One actually ran in the local newspaper, proudly saying that they had produced 500 of the officers' uniforms for the war, and that anybody who came in to get their uniform from there had a 10% discount. Um, people were actively participating in the war effort in lots of different ways. And this ultimately comes down to really what the story of America is, right? You know, we have people who come from all around the world, you know, Britain, Germany, China, Japan, Korea all over the world who want to make a life for themselves. And the Jewish community is no different than that. Um, they participate in the war, and their roots are tied into the war just as much as anybody else's are in America. And you know, when you think about the war, oftentimes we think about the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, but we can't discount the people who participate in this war because it's a war for all of the heart and soul of the country. And so I encourage you, go out, find some research. There's not a great deal of biography on Benjamin, and I don't think there's a single one fully on Solomon. But it's an opportunity for you to get engaged, learn a little bit more, 
and kind of expand your horizon and perspective on the course of the war. Um, you know, it's the great thing about the Civil War history is that you can spend a whole lifetime learning about it and still never cover even 10% of the darn thing. And so I'd like to say thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. But um, yeah, I really appreciate it, and everybody and the receptiveness of this audience. All right, I see a hand in the back. You got yours first up. Lewis Grant, what was his uh, take during the war and then when he became president? Ah, so, um, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that people wanted to discuss was about, you know, are we going to talk about discrimination in the war? And I largely wanted to turn away from that. Uh, Grant had kind of a weird history. It's actually probably the blackest mark in the Union cause for Jewish people during the war. Uh, Grant f fights primarily in the West, and during the course of the war, he eventually starts getting bogged down with, well, salesmen, newspapermen, and he will largely blame this on people of the Jewish faith. And this is really one of the great black spots of Grant's you know, leadership during the war, is that he will have a general order, I believe it's general order number three, um, if anybody here is a Civil War buff who knows this better than I do, you're welcome to chip in. And this will expel Jewish people from his essential general jurisdiction as he's serving in the war. Um, now, there's no indication that Jewish people were actively harming the Union war effort. Many of them were staunch Unionists. Now, many of them were also Confederates, but many of them were also staunch Unionists as well. And because of this, people were displaced. They had to move. They had to move around the country. It is ultimately one of the great black spots in the Union effort over the course of the war. And I really don't have a great deal of input other than to add that fact that it's not a perfect story, but you know, we have to look at the uplift and the negative. So I appreciate you doing that. Yes? Were any of the uh, Southern uh, Jewish frame of slave owners that you know of? Uh, well, Benjamin was for certain. Uh, he had a few hundred slaves in, in his, or enslaved people in the course of his lifetime. Um, what we see is that slavery was so endemic that we see people who have literally hundreds of enslaved people in their homes and on their property, and we have people who own one or two people. Um, even today, I think that it's needless to say that regardless of how many people you owned, um, it's a great moral evil. Um, people who lived in the cities oftentimes had specifically you know, enslaved people who worked with them and for them. Uh, there's a great Frederick Douglass quote in his biographies where he goes to the city and he says that working in the city is, you know, you'd meet these enslaved people who work in the city and they seem practically free compared to him on the farm. And consequently, I, the assumption is that there had to have been certainly some who did, um, even with the devotions of their faith and the understanding of discrimination that they had in Europe, you know, it was an endemic part of their culture, and they weren't able to divorce themselves from that. And if they wanted to really be participating in Southern society, there was no getting around it. What is, what is the population of the United States at that time of Jewish faith? Oh, goodness me. So, forgive me, my numbers are not the strong suit. I wouldn't be working in a history museum if they were. Um, traditionally, to my understanding, it actually went from, again, seven congregations to 161. Almost 1% 1 of the American public was Jewish by this point. It may have been a little under that, but we do see a large boon in this, in this time period. Again, more people met Jewish folks during this time than any other time period in their lifetime up to then. If there's no other questions, again, thank you all, folks. I appreciate it. You're, I'll stick around if anybody wants to do one-on-ones, because I know public speaking is scary. And again, thank you all so much. Thank you.